Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I'm going to be sharing just a few thoughts today about Omicron and um, what I've been looking at from my research point of view. So if you're interested in that, just hang fire and join me for another few minutes of chat. Okay, so where is the best place to start? when thinking about Omicron? Well, my view is that you start with the World Health Organization. What is their view on Omicron? So when we look at what the WHO has said, and we can see across here that they have put out this update on the 28th of November 2021. So that's a little bit over a week ago. And they're speaking about the variant B11529, variant of concern named Omicron. So they have limited knowledge about the Omicron um, virus at the moment or the variant. And they're not sure about transmissibility. That's changing day by day. They're not sure about severity of disease. It's suggested that it could be um, more mild, but it's a little bit too early to tell. And they're showing, however, preliminary data suggest increased rates of hospitalizations in South Africa. Um, effectiveness of prior SARS-CoV-2 infection, the preliminary evidence they thought may be an increased risk of reinfection for people who have had uh, COVID-19. Effectiveness of vaccines, they're trying to understand the potential impact of this variant um, on existing countermeasures, including vaccines. And critically, when you look at their recommended actions, they could suggest that you continue with your public health strategies, recommended actions for people, effective measures, keep your distance, well, uh, wear a well-fitting mask, open windows, keep hands clean, and get vaccinated when it's your turn. So those are the general principles that the WHO has put forward. So what do we know so far? And as I said, not a lot. Each day, the information changes, and there's more information out there even today. And the most recent uh, confirmed locations, this was probably about three or four days ago, so this may have changed a little bit more. But the confirmed locations include, well, South Africa, we know, and there is uh, North America, uh, Brazil, Australia, um, Japan, Singa um, uh, 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 Hong Kong. You can see here in Europe, a number of countries in Europe as well uh, already had the Omicron variant. So we know that it has spread across the world. The question that we ask is one, is it more transmissible? And there are certainly evidence to suggest that it looks as though it's more transmissible than the other variants. And one of the early um, bits of information that came out, this suggested in terms of the speed of spread, you can see here, this covers all the other variants, the alpha, beta, uh, and the delta variant. The delta variant had the highest peak and also had the secondary peak here. When we compare that to Omicron here, we can see that the speed with which it's going up is significantly different from the other trend that we've seen. So this suggests that it is quite transmissible. But the fact that it is quite transmissible does not necessarily equate to severe disease. Some people hope that actually what we've got here is almost a form of mucosal immunity. If that many people get it and they're then immune and prevent the virus from spreading further. So here are some details about what the spike protein looks like. And this is where the variations occur. And uh, just to remind everybody on some basic sciences, when you have a virus, this is the envelope, this round part, and on top of it are the spike proteins. And the spike protein tends to bind like a lock uh, to a key to ACE2 and go inside the cell. That's the mechanics of what the virus uses. Any one of these spike proteins will get it inside the cell. So when we look at that spike protein, what is the difference between that spike protein 
and what was there before. So we've got an image here that compares the, the two. So here we have the Delta variant, which was a more recent one. And where you see these red spots, these usually mean the mutations that the Delta variant had from the original strain of the virus. So there are quite a few mutations here that the Delta had. But look at the Omicron. Goodness gracious, these are a lot of mutations, quite significant mutations that occur. And um, it's this that gets people concerned. Will it be able to evade antibodies either from natural infection or from the vaccine? And this is the big question. Here's an important practical point, and this is part of the reason why I encourage people to get more educated about COVID-19. Use your research. I'm happy to share what I know. As you can see, I've got an introductory ebook that will help even a basic understanding about COVID-19. But onto the spike protein again. One thing that people tend not to take into consideration is that this spike protein is usually in two positions open and closed. This is the open position. And what the virus tends to do is keep it closed so that it's hidden. This is the receptor binding domain. This is where it binds to the ACE2. So in effect, if it can keep it hidden, it's harder for antibodies to neutralize it because it's critically the receptor binding domain that is the most important part with regards to allowing it to get inside the cell. And when we look again at this picture here, antibodies may be binding on the outside, and those are what you would call non-neutralizing because they don't actually necessarily stop this part from binding to ACE2. This is the critical bit that the virus tends to keep in the closed position and only opens it intermittently so that antibodies are not as effective against it. And so this is part of the challenge with Omicron. We also need to know how effective the virus has become at evading antibodies. And just again, anyone who has been following my research knows that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection is usually relatively mild in the first part. It's the second stage or the immune phase of the disease that is actually very severe. So a mild infection doesn't necessarily mean much when we say it's mild. The question is what happens after 10 to 12 days in people who are at high risk for COVID-19? That's the proof of the pudding. Additionally, South Africa may be, represent an interesting piece of research because I don't know what percentage of the healthcare um, population in South Africa is vaccinated, but it will be interesting to see what is the infection rate between the two groups? And that's very useful to know. And that's a useful challenge in terms of comparing natural immunity and vaccine immunity. Which one will actually be more effective? And we really, really need to know this kind of data to understand a little bit better about the virus. Just a reminder of what it is that I've been focused on in my research is the fact that severe COVID-19 is related to an autoimmune response to the combination of free spike um, free serum ACE2 combining with the spike protein. This is what it would look like. And what our research suggests is that this process here is what triggers very severe disease. So in fact, it's not so much the virus that does the damage, it's our immune system. And that's a very, very important differentiator because only when we understand how our immune system works in relation to Omicron will we have a better understanding of the risk and how many lives could be at risk from this, this very important variant. Um, I appreciate all those who have been um, with me today. Um, Yes, thank you very much, uh, Graham. And um, we've got a note here from Ian. Thank you very much. And um, I appreciate Graham again saying, I, I try and share what I can. Please take up the offer with regards to the introductory um, ebook. It will help even a basic understanding of uh, the disease and help people to grasp a little bit more about COVID-19.
Look out for our next talk, hopefully coming up in another few days or a week, depending on when I have some more information to share. Have a great day, everyone, and look forward to speaking again.